Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let's make the first people sitting. Um, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. And uh, I first want to thank uh, our great uh, collaborator, uh, uh, Claudia Dorfmuller and Kim Foss, because the Disruption Network Lab is uh, uh, also thanks to them. And of course, also Daniela, <laughs> also Daniela Silvestrin, that today will also speak a bit at the end. And, uh, but uh, I would like to first invite on stage our speakers today, otherwise uh, I feel a bit lonely here. And uh, just uh, to give you a little introduction, uh, we are a program that is funded by the Regier and the Burgemeister for Berlin uh, City Tax. And uh, we are working in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And so we have a long lasting uh, cooperation with the Kunst am Kreuzberg Britannien. And for this year, a lot of great uh, collaboration. And uh, for this specific event, uh, uh, the Nome Gallery, Spectrum Project Space, the Wow Holland Stiftung, the Copenhagen Center for Disaster Research, the Alexander for Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And then we have uh, with us the Free Chelsea Manning Initiative Berlin that I really want to thank uh, because uh, already yesterday they did uh, really big work with their presence and especially saying that uh, their presence also signs a six year of prison for Chelsea Manning. And so if you want to know a bit more about uh, the appeal that started the 20th of May, uh, you can speak with the people at the stand over there. But now we enter into <laughs> our deep cable moment. And I'm really happy to introduce uh, uh, on stage Andrew Bloom and Bern Fix. And I will personally introduce Bern, that is the moderator, and then he will introduce Andrew. And I'm really uh, glad also to introduce Bern, because this uh, also is part of our cooperation with the Wow Holland Stiftung. And uh, uh, I want also to give you a little background, since uh, I don't usually like to go too back in history, but uh, uh, as you can also probably hear from my accent, I am Italian, and uh, <laughs> in Italy we have a really deep uh, admiration for Wow Holland, that I don't know if many people of you know, for sure Bern can tell you much better than me, uh, but he was one of the co-founders of the Chaos Computer Club, and he passed away in 2001, and when he passed away, Bern and other people founded the Wow Holland Stiftung. And for the Italian crowd, but not only for us, I think also for German and worldwide, Wow Holland was really important because connected in a really great way the discourse of politics, uh, activism, and hacking. And we have Bern here. Uh, he's a German hacker and computer security expert. And he joined the Chaos Computer Club in 1996, so it was basically the start of it. Yeah, more or less. And uh, between 1987 and 1999, he was the spokesperson for the Chaos Computer Club. And uh, he works on uh, computer security, uh, focusing especially on uh, virus research. And for example, in 1987, he managed to neutralize the Vienna virus that was the first documented antivirus software ever written. So that is such a really big thing. And um, so, as I say, uh, after the death of Wow Holland, uh, uh, together with other people, he established the Wow Holland Foundation, and he serves uh, as a founding member on the board of direction since. So now I'm really happy to leave the word to Bern, and then we will enjoy the keynote with Andrew Bloom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, let me start that I usually don't keep many old computer magazines. And as you heard, I've been in this computer business since the late 70s. Um, but sometimes I do. And if I do, there is always a personal reason to do so. Because it had an impact on my life in one way or another. Uh, and this publication, uh, and I have it here in real because I actually still have it. This is... Uh, a Wired publication 
uh, from December 1996. Uh, and one of the reasons that I kept it all this time because it made me read all the books of Neil Stevenson and he's still one of my favorite authors. Uh, I'm a dedicated science fiction reader, uh, so his novelization of computer science that fits me well. I mean, as I know as for many other hackers as well. Um, his long article in Wired, this edition, is describing the wiring of the planet with undersea cables. And as he traveled the world as a hacker tourist, uh, he documented the physical reality behind the cyberspace. So he was one of the first to actually go to the landing places, talk to the people on the, on the boats that actually lay the cables uh, in the ocean. Uh, it's a long story, but it's a really interesting one. Um, and this got me interested in undersea cables, of course, as well. And not just their physical representations or for the locations they are involved with, but also what this means for the control and in the end of the surveillance of the internet. And at that time, the internet was just an emerging technology uh, publicly, publicly known to not so many people. I mean, I, I think it was 1995 when people started to use the internet. So, Neil Stevenson also wrote Cryptonomicon some three years later. He transformed his experience with the cable story, so to speak, uh, into a book that is certainly a must read for anyone, uh, for, for every hacker, especially those interested into, in, in encryption. So, but the most important thing I learned from the article is that laying submarine cables is big business. It often costs more than $200 million to do so, and therefore it's not surprising that many of these cables are laid and operated by private companies or joint ventures of these private companies. Nation states are often simply too broke or too uninterested to lay cables themselves. And many of these big commercial players in the cable business are, of course, telecoms. That's what you would expect. But a lot of these big companies live in the dark. Companies, people, or not many people have ever heard of. But obviously these companies have enough money uh, for, from whatever sources to finance such, such endeavors. As I said, 200 million is the minimum. Every cable under the sea, and that's what we can conclude from this, is therefore the physical manifestation of a purpose, of an intent. Sometimes these purposes are obvious, sometimes they are not. Both cases are interesting because they both tell us something about how this world works. Um, let me give you an example. An example for the obvious reason is the Project Express, of some 3,000 mile fiber cable in the North Atlantic between London and New York that was laid, I think, just three or four years ago. The costs are some... 300 million, probably a little bit more. And in the end, the costs were covered by stock traders. The cable, and there are a lot of cables between uh, uh, continental Europe and uh, America. Um, this cable is 5.2 milliseconds faster than any other cable connecting America and Europe. But why spend 300 millions for 5.2 milliseconds? Well, 5.2 milliseconds make a fucking huge difference if you're in the high frequency trading business. Um, so it connects, this cable especially connects the stock exchanges of New York and London. And if you ever dreamed of shaking up the global economy, you certainly would if you accidentally cut this cable somewhere in between. But some cables seem to serve no immediate obvious purpose, like the Swalbot undersea cable system a redundant five terabit per second connection with just three landing points in Norway and the remote and actually very cold island of Svalbard, in German Spitzbergen, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. This, this island has a population of some five, 2,500 people and five terabit per second would give them an each of, the, uh, uh, each of these persons an unshared bandwidth of two gigabytes per second assuming that polar bears are not interested in Facebook and Google and don't have the money to buy computers. So the official cover story for these cables is that it's used for satellite tracking and data collection stations operated on Svalbard. 
They receive and transmit data from and to satellites in polar orbit. Sounds legit, doesn't it? Let us do some math here. Svalbard is certainly far enough north that the connection between polar orbit satellites and the ground is, nearly possi is possible on nearly every revolution of the satellite, giving it about one hour visibility for each satellite every day. Assuming there are some 600 satellites in polar orbit, that's what the official and publicly available data suggests, and that the mean bandwidth of a downlink from the satellite to the ground is around 500 megabits per second. This would sum up into some 75 terabits byte data per day that has to be transmitted. And if you transmit that evenly over time, that would require a bandwidth of 7 gigabyte per second. Quite impressive. But compared to the capacity of 5 terabit, it's nearly neglectable. Even if the estimate is wrong by a factor of 10, no, even if it's wrong by a factor of 100, there are still more than 4.5 terabit of bandwidth that are unaccounted for. So what the hell is going on on Svalbard? Interestingly enough is that Norway, it, the, the, the landing point in Norway is uh, close to, to Tromsø, that's north of the Arctic Circle. Um, and Norway does not have the capacity to transfer this data outside, at least not from what we know. So now we can only dive into conspiracy theory, but uh, where's the data ending? It cannot be in Tromsø. That's a little place I've been before, and uh, it doesn't look like there are huge data centers up there. So these are interesting questions you can, you can derive from just looking at the physical infrastructure of the cable, undersea cables we have today. But before we dive too deep into conspiracy theories here, let's get back to Earth and uh, hear Andrew Bloom. Andrew is the author of the book Tubes, A Journey to the Center of the Internet, and the German title is Kabelsalat, which is, of course, very nice for me as a hacker from the KS Computer Club, because that's one of the mottos of the KS Computer Club. Kabelsalat ist gesund. Um, and that book asks many, many questions as well. What is the Internet physically, and where is it really? So Andrew's stories chronicle the dramatic story of the Internet's development, explains how it all works, and takes us the first ever in-depth look inside these hidden monuments of the Internet. We will hopefully, and he will hopefully, give us some answers too, especially to the question of how can we know the Internet's possibility if we don't know how it's physical reality. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon, or evening, I guess, somewhere in between. Um, thanks uh, all for coming out. I'm, I'm curious, just uh, from the get-go, how many of you were here yesterday? Okay, good, okay. Um, those who weren't, uh, uh, we, we showed a lot of pictures of manholes, and there will be more pictures of manholes, I promise, and, and more. Um, the, uh, there's also, I mean, if there, I was tempted to make a, a internet infrastructure bingo card, um, so each time somebody mentions a manhole or there's a picture of a beach or a, 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 a Google satellite image of data centers, um, you can play bingo or drink or whatever, whatever, the, whatever the appropriate game is. Um, because it's, uh, it, this has been uh, special and unusual to get uh, the relatively small number of us together um, who have been passionate about going to look for the internet uh, for this um, and, and taking these strange field trips, uh, sometimes alone, sometimes together, um, sometimes for, for, for over, over the course of too many years now. Um, but um, but it, doesn't, it doesn't really get old, especially as the internet keeps, keeps changing. Um, I also want to say to start off that, my, that given the expertise and given the, uh, the kind of sophistication of what we heard yesterday, um, my title is probably too basic. Uh, it's not, I'm not just going to tell you what it is. I'm going to try to go, go past that and in particular try to connect uh, what the Internet's made of and who built it and how it got the way it is um, with uh, the entirely new um, and astonishing and pressing set of questions that have come up um, since the Snowden revelations uh, exactly, exactly three years ago. Um, the, uh, the, um, that 
I also, as well, because we've, of both what we heard yesterday and because I, th I think that you're an audience that, that knows um, more from, as a starting point, about how the internet fits together, want to trace some of my own arc of understanding uh, of how I came to these places and a, a bit of background. And one thing in particular that I've come to realize um, over the last few years uh, is the necessity of looking um, and explaining really closely uh, why some places let you in to see their pieces of the internet and why some places don't um, and why some places let some people in but not others uh, and to really recognize um, what the powers are behind the access to these places that are not really secret um, but, uh, but have um, either a, quite a bit of, um, of economic and political importance behind them, uh, not, not just in terms of the NSA uh, but in terms of who owns our data and where it, where it sits. Um, I wanted to start here, though, uh, because I, I couldn't not. Uh, this, um, this is my grandfather um, on a summer evening uh, in Berlin, obviously, uh, on his way to a lecture like this. I don't know, not about the internet. Um, but uh, I've had this picture on my wall for years. Uh, so this is about 1924, 25. Uh, he's 20 years old, maybe 21 years old. Um, and it's... It, it's always, I mean, it's this notion of Berlin in the 20s is, is somewhat mythic. Uh, the notion of Berlin in the teens uh, is equally, the current teens is mythic as well. And I not only, I mean, I pointed out for two reasons. I mean, one, to sort of enjoy the, enjoy coming back to, to, for, to participate in the culture of Berlin, um, but of course also to, um, to make the point uh, that he, uh, you know, that they was, was a Jew, had grew, born in Hanover, uh, came to Berlin, uh, in the 20s, moved back to Hanover, started a business, um, left in 38, um, a couple of months before Kristallnacht. Uh, by the 60s, was so German, they were coming back to Germany for vacations. Um, but, uh, but the course of these moments of cosmopolitanism, and certainly in the US as well, we're thinking a lot about these moments of totalitarianism that, that contradict them, um, seem quite, quite vivid to me, particularly given the, the acceleration that the internet might provide. Uh, and um, I, it, it seemed as I started to think more and more about um, the implications not only of the NSA spying but the implications of the way in which uh, companies like Google and Facebook are pushing into our lives uh, that the recognition of the, the ebb and flow of these power structures is absolutely crucial to think about. I also like his bike. For me, I, I started this project uh, in about 2008. Um, and uh, at the time, I was, um, was writing mostly for, for Wired magazine. Uh, and I was writing mostly about big physical things. That was kind of my, my, my portfolio. Uh, so I was never writing about software companies. Uh, I was writing about skyscrapers and air traffic and things like that. Um, but I had been, for the years before that, writing mostly about architecture, about buildings. And one of the things uh, that was one of the reasons, the reason I wanted to write about architecture was because you got to go out and see buildings. Like that seemed like fun to me. Uh, and that was the case for a while. Um, when the recession hit in 2008, um, I was no longer going out and seeing buildings. People were sending me JPEGs of buildings um, and I was sitting at my desk looking at those pictures. And then uh, not only that, but I was, um, it was the year, 2007 was the year the iPhone came out. So by 2008, um, I and most of us were walking around like this. And so rather than being engaged, rather than sitting at my desk and looking at my screen uh, and then going out into the world and being engaged with the physical world, uh, I was going out into the world and looking at my screen some more. Uh, and what was strange about that for me was the, 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 the sense that there was no physical reality behind that screen. So as a writer about architecture and about design uh, and about travel, I was professionally engaged with this idea of, 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 of places and of the experience of places and of what they felt like and smelled like and, and who built them and how they got there. And yet I had lost huge pieces of that. Uh, all, I was spending all my time, um, I won't say in cyberspace, but looking at this flat object uh, and there was absolutely no discussion about what was behind it. The other thing that happened um, was uh, in the US at least, there was this talk um, of stimulus funding uh, for lots of different projects and for lots of different infrastructure projects. And the phrase that was always attached to it was shovels in the ground. Uh, we were gonna get shovels in the ground to get the economy going. And one of the categories of stimulus funding was broadband stimulus. And I hadn't in a decade since the, since the broadband boom uh, and then bust and scandal that followed it, I hadn't heard very many people talk about 
um, shovels in the context of broadband. The internet was built, it was done, that was that. I, there was just, there wasn't really anything to say. And for Wired, I went, to, went down to Washington um, uh, from New York where I live for the, the, to the uh, US Department of Commerce uh, for the kickoff meeting for what was called the BTOP program, the Broadband Stimulus Program. And I expected that it might be a lawyer from Verizon uh, and a lawyer from Comcast uh, fighting over the, whatever it was, maybe $200 million, I forget the number that was gonna be distributed. Instead, there was a, uh, a large auditorium that was chock full of people who owned small pieces of the internet. And I began to realize that there was more to the internet than just these brands that we knew and our ISPs, and there were actually a whole lot of pieces of it that were owned by spy individuals who were quite willing to talk about them and eager to talk about them, and in fact had a, had a, had a lot of bones to pick with it. And so I had these two, these two threads. I had one, this kind of low-grade existential crisis about not having a sense of what was physically behind the screen, uh, and then I had this sense that a lot of people were gonna start building new pieces of the internet. And even more vividly than that, that the internet had pieces to build, that it wasn't just this ether, uh, that it wasn't just this thing that, that was out there somewhere, but in fact had, had specific parts uh, that were owned by many people and of course were somehow connected together. And yet this, I mean this image again and again and again and again. Uh, and yesterday we saw, you know, I mean you can choose a, there, there are plenty of, plenty of, of beautiful things to choose to, to represent you know, poor, poor metaphors for the internet. Um, but this was the one that I was stuck on, um, mainly, I think, for me, because of its resemblance to the, the blue marble picture of the Earth. Um, I think that we're similarly kind of supposed to be, look at this picture of the internet and be in awe uh, of its expanse. Where you're not really supposed to find yourself on this. I mean, supposedly, you know, each little thread of light does have a, you know, there is a key to this, to this image um, by, by Opti. Um, but you're not, that's not the point. This isn't a map. It's a, it's a visualization that doesn't really visualize anything at all. And, uh, and it was incredibly frustrating to me. Um, and I just, I couldn't get over the idea that this was what we had sort of accepted as what the internet looked like. Then one day this happened. Um, my internet at home broke. I feel like I need music for this, for this story now. Um, and uh, the cable guy came to fix it. Uh, and he followed the cable from this clump of wires behind my couch. And, out to the back of my building uh, and um, then uh, said this thing which changed my life, um, which was a squirrel is chewing on your internet and, um, and it seemed preposterous uh, because um, as we all know, the internet is this revolutionary thing. The internet has changed everything. Um, the internet is not something that squirrels chew on, um, but sure enough, a squirrel had chewed on my internet. Uh, and. Um, I mean, I, I've told this story now so many times it's become a bit, a, a, a bit apocryphal, but I promise there really was a squirrel. Um, the image that I had quite clearly was, and, and not just as a narrative device, but, but truly that if there was a physical piece beyond just the first six feet that I saw at home, then there had to be physical points along the way. And I remember talking to my editor at Wired, who was in San Francisco, and we both knew how the internet worked. We knew about packets, we knew all of this. But somehow we had exchanged the idea of saying that the internet takes many paths for saying that the inter internet takes no paths. Um, that we'd said that, that in saying there are many, we had, we had lost sight of the fact um, that, that there were any at all. Uh, and I began to sort of wonder how, again, how far could you, could you go? How far, if you did follow the cable, um, and, and Henrik and Moritz and I share, you know, share, share, share this way of thinking about it. If you did follow the cable, uh, what would you find and who built it and what would be there? Um, and then very quickly, and again, this is a recurring theme in Journeys to the Internet, very quickly you feel very stupid um, because people tell you that the Internet is actually that other cultural thing. The Internet isn't also that physical thing. Um, there are, I mean, again, we could spend all day sharing Internet, Internet, uh, you know, pictures of what the internet isn't, but this is, this is, this is still my favorite. Um, the episode of South Park, um, if anyone knows the particular episode, there are lots of sorted things that happen in the beginning. Yes, I, I have a, there's a fan in the, in the front row, yep. <laughs> um, in this one, the internet breaks, uh, but there's no internet to know if the internet's broken, so they go to Starbucks, because that's where the internet is, um, but there's no internet there either. Uh, so they become uh, internet refugees in California, because um, that's where the internet is, obviously. Um, and, uh, and then finally they come to this place, which is the internet, and they try to do everything they can to get it to turn back on, they play the Close Encounters of the Third Kind music at it, 
um, and they shoot at it, and then one of the little guys uh, goes up the ramp and unplugs it and plugs it back in. And they say, you know, the, the flashing yellow light is steady green, you know, salvation, we're saved. Um, and, um, and as stupid as I felt when, um, when somebody sent this to me, and this is from uh, 2007 or 2008, it wasn't, wasn't that old at the time, I, the first time I sort of made this joke to a network engineer, um, the response was, yeah, we do that sometimes. We, turn, we pl unplug the router and plug it back in. Um, not one, of course, um, but a lot fewer um, than you might expect. And then again, there's this, this question of, of metaphor. Um, uh, this was originally on, the, on, on James Bridle's new aesthetic blog. I, I, some research firm came up with this um, in a stroke of genius. Um, and I, 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 do not, I, mean, I do not know the answer to this question. Um, it, seems, it seems like it could go either way. And obviously, um, the general public agrees with me um, that the stormy weather may and may not interfere with cloud computing. Um, but it indicates, I mean, the confusion about if this is physical or if it is virtual, um, or if most likely um, it really is both. For me, though, uh, to deal with it, um, to deal with the both uh, wasn't really an option. Um, and in fact, what I tried to do, partly out of necessity um, and um, partly um, out of the recognition of trying to tell a story about this, was to ignore the logical, um, to just ignore what was happening inside the boxes. Um, that's absolute hair safe for if you're a hacker, but that was what I did um, because I'm not a hacker and I don't know how to code at all, and that was that, and I wasn't going to look at the, the zeros and ones and any of the language. Instead, all I was going to do um, was what I had been doing all along, which was look at places, look at the geography of, these, of the internet, um, and look at things and buildings, um, look at, at, its, at, its, at its physical reality. So I was ignoring the logical. I was, getting, I was sort of dispensing with that as much as possible. Um, and instead, I was looking only at the physical and the geographic about what it actually was made of and, and where it was. And I called my editor at Wired and said, let's you know, forget this broadband stimulus thing. Uh, you know, you know, there's this, all this other stuff out there. Let's, let's do it. Let's do a story. I did not know the Neil Stevenson piece. The first thing he said to me was, you know, we did that. I said, oh, no, I actually didn't know about that one. I think, um, I think the internet infrastructure geeks either fall into the, the, uh, the, either you're a science fiction fan or a spy fan, you're one or the other. Um, I kind of fall into the spy side. I think I know other people here fall into the spy side as well. Um, but he, um, we sort of joked, okay, you know, we'd forgotten about the wires. Um, this, is, this is great. Uh, and he um, ran around the office and said, you know, let's, can we do this story? Let's do it, let's do it. And he called me back about half an hour later, which is very fast in magazine land and said, we love it, we love it, do it, you have 600 words. And I said, <laughs> okay. Um, it, it was gonna be a photo essay and a slideshow. Uh, and um, they, um, in, uh, they found um, uh, the person that was very quickly chosen to shoot it was um, a, a photographer named Randall Mesden, um, who is uh, very well known for shooting the, the, um, the Mark Wahlberg, or at the time Marky Mark, Calvin Klein underwear ads. Um, uh, but now he was going to go out in search of the internet, and, um, and he and I had a good time um, over the next few months uh, basically calling up people who own parts of the internet and asking them if we could take photographs. Um, and these were very surprising phone calls. Um, nobody had asked this question, uh, at least since the broadband bust. And I feel like a lot of that had to do with the generation of journalists um, that basically got, got burned uh, pretty badly on the broadband story in the kind of 98 to 2002 period, um, where this was the thing that was, that was driving the bubble. Um, it burst spectacularly, and uh, all of that generation of folks who are now in their mid-40s um, didn't want to touch the story again. Um, it just, they had, they, had, they had learned their lesson the first time. So I started making these phone calls, and uh, they got very strange very quickly. Um, this is a, um, a fiber optic regeneration hut uh, in the middle of Kansas. Um, and the reason Randall went to, to shoot this place um, was because um, I, Talk, was talk, had on the phone a, a person who was um, a sort of uh, uh, external relations PR person for what at the time was Global Crossing is now level three, um, and said, "Okay, we want to. You know, is there a fiber optic hut? You know, regeneration hut in the middle of the country? Yes. You know, where's the middle of the country? Kansas." And then she got on the phone um, a guy, uh, their technician in Kansas City, um, who has a white pickup truck with a lightning bolt on the side. Um, whose job was to, um, to take care and maintain all of the fiber optic regeneration huts in a 500 mile radius of Kansas City. Um, and then we had to ask him which was the most beautiful fiber optic regeneration hut. Um, and this is absolutely the most beautiful fiber optic regeneration hut within 500 miles of Kansas City. But it started to seem that, um, that there, 
there were these places out there that you could go visit, um, but you had to stop trying to follow the bits. And there was a real distinction between following the bits and following the cable. That rather than trying to trace the path of a message or of a, of a website loading or anything like that, which is how we experience the internet when we're sitting in front of our screens, instead I realized I had to, had to plant my feet by the side of the road and kind of watch the bits fly by. Um, I had to kind of reverse that and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in one place on Earth and I'm going to understand why that place is where it is and why the internet is where it is. And rather than trying to, to sort of move at light speed and, and, and make my way through the network um, in, in that sense and, and trace it there. Uh, and, and that began to, um, to uncover a whole bunch of different scales as well. Uh, there were times where I was talking, thinking about the scale of cities um, and there were times where I was thinking about the scale of a single cable. Um, and in particular, thinking about the way that the networks of the internet connect to each other, the kind of the inter and internet. Um, and I, you can't really convince me otherwise, but the, the, this yeah, a yellow jumper cable I think is the inter and internet. Um, this is what connects two networks to each other. Um, the router of a Facebook or a Google or a Deutsche Telekom or whatever it is um, to the router of a, of a, of a, of a, of a bank or a, or a Comcast or a Telesonera or whoever, whatever, whatever, other, whatever other big network is out there. And at some point, and it turns out in not very many places around the world, um, those networks are connected to each other directly, uh, router to router, up through in a specific place with a yellow fiber optic cable like this that's so literally filled with light that when you bend it, you can see the light. And I, I started to think about the necessity of, of zooming in and zooming out in geography, uh, in, in geographic scale. Um, sort of like the, the, the Eames movie, Powers of Ten, which is a, a, a favorite of a lot of, a lot of people who kind of go, to, go look for these things, where uh, at, you had to kind of contain within a single story, within a single moment, um, something you could hold in your hand, as well as something that's at the scale of continents. And at the same time, I started saying, okay, well, if, if, there, if I could begin to understand how networks are connected physically to each other with cables like this, then what about the most important places? What, one more scale up, and, and, and what were those places? And I did it, and tried to, there were lists, but the lists seemed, seemed a little bit strange. Um, and when I started asking network engineers what were the most important places on the internet, um, a familiar list of cities came up uh, with a few outliers as well. Um, New York, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Tokyo, Ashburn. Uh, Ashburn not being a major world capital, um, but being an unincorporated suburb in Virginia outside of Washington, D.C., but in fact is perhaps maybe the, the biggest capital of the internet at all. And the buildings where these networks were connected to each other uh, were um, surprisingly potent in their history. Um, this is, I think, my favorite still. Um, this is 60 Hudson Street uh, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, it was the Western Union Telegraph building. Um, its telecommunications history was, was, was discontinuous. There was a period in time uh, where Western Union had, had left um, and uh, the internet had not moved in and what began to change, what, what began to change things was when um, the, the um, bell system was broken up in the 80s. Um, Henrik talked about this a little bit yesterday and there was the recognition that all of these new startups, companies like MCI, needed a beachhead uh, to put their own equipment and then connect back into the, into the, into the, into the original bell system. And so you, and the Western Union building was, was not particularly well used, and it turned out that, that as part of the, the, uh, the sale of the building, the, what was left of Western Union, basically now a money transfer company, had retained rights to their quote unquote network, which in fact meant the series of ducks, the underground ducks that connected 60 Hudson with AT&T's long line buildings a few, blo a few blocks away at 32 Avenue of the Americas. And um, it was the guy who ran MCI who realized that, that, that he could put his equipment at 60 Hudson and then plug back into 32 Avenue of the Americas to the Bell system. And everywhere you go in the world, um, you see this same kind of pattern. Uh, you see, at least in downtowns, you see the, the old uh, incumbent telephone building and then uh, like a parasite somewhere close by, um, the building that the internet then moved into in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and it's always quite fun to see because you, I mean, the telephone buildings are these, they're, they're master planned. Um, you know, somebody said uh, they're, they're, off, they're often similar from city to city. Um, somebody in the central office uh, decided that they would be as robust as possible. And then the internet buildings are often really ad hoc. Uh, and that recognition that the internet is constantly growing from the bottom up, uh, rather than with any kind of, um, any kind of master planned logic, um, became a real sort of guiding, guiding principle for me. Um, this is my favorite Western Union building from, of the 
the tube center in the basement uh, from the 30s um, with the pneumatic tubes that uh, were then later filled with fiber optic cable, but at the time uh, were using for telegraph messages. This is the most important door on the internet. Should I expand on that or should I just, should I just leave it there? <laughs> Um, this, is, this, is, this is Ashburn. This is, um, this, is, this is the most important door on the internet. This is the, the door to um, uh, Equinix 5, 5, 5, I'm going to go with 5, um, which, um, which is unmarked, um, but behind there is, is probably the densest um, point of interconnection of anywhere in the world. And I call it one of about 12 buildings in the world um, that are the most important um, by virtue of the fact that in those buildings, more networks connect to each other physically um, by about an order of magnitude. So uh, someplace like 60 Hudson um, or Telehouse in London um, or DKIX in Frankfurt, which is a little bit of a different story, um, will have somewhere in around 500 networks interconnecting. And a second tier city um, like Berlin, in fact, would have somewhere around 50 networks interconnecting. Uh, and that pattern holds pretty much, there's only, a, only about a dozen cities in the world um, that have this sort of hundreds of networks interconnecting and then there are many, many cities with, with 50 and then a, a third tier city will then have maybe five networks interconnecting, that's, that's really held. Um, so behind this door um, is the sort of, you know, this, this is, is where absolutely the, the uh, you are most likely to, to touch in your, in your travels and your near travels in a given day. Um, when, um, it, for a long time, it was, it was, its location was quasi-secret. Um, when, uh, when Tubes was published, um, uh, the piece uh, that I wrote about Equinix Ashburn uh, was excerpted on, on Gizmodo, and um, we thought we were being very cheeky by saying that the, um, the, the, giving the story the headline, The Bullseye of America's Internet, uh, and um, had a map drawn up that had you know, uh, Ashburn with concentric circles, you know, red circles around it, saying this is the bullseye of America's Internet. And uh, within about an hour of the story um, being posted, uh, Equinex tweeted, we are the bullseye of America's internet um, because the commercial imperative always um, trumps the security imperative. Um, and uh, as much as uh, there's any you know, nervousness about if you talk about these places, um, somebody's gonna blow up the internet um, again and again, particularly for these points of interconnection, the need for, for, for for them to be public facing somehow, for network engineers to know that these are the most important places of the internet um, always comes before uh, any ability or desire to keep them secret. Um, and um, I mean, I'm sure there was a security person somewhere cringing with this, um, but uh, there were more marketing people um, cheering that, that they in fact were the bullseye of America's internet. And I should say, um, Ingrid and I were talking about this before, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, the, I, there, were mo there was a moment where nobody wanted to talk about these things, and as the business has gotten much more competitive, um, all anybody wants is for, you know, is for attention to be paid to their data center. And so the age of kind of secrecy and conspiracy of these, of these places, I think, is really, is really long past. We'll talk about that more. This is a, a school group um, at the most famous door to the internet. Uh, another uh, moment of internet, internet tourism. Uh, is Heinrich here? No, other one. <laughs> um, no, I think he went back to Hamburg. Um, uh, this is, um, he was here yesterday. This is his picture inside the D-Kick switch uh, at Telecity in Frankfurt. Um, and uh, these buildings always, they, they're designed to look like what we want them to look like. Um, sort of form follows fantasy with them uh, at Equinex. Um, that means um, they have these blue lights in the aisles and when you ask them why the lights are blue, they say, oh, for security or for energy efficiency. And then if you kind of pinch them, they say, actually, they just look fucking cool and like that's, that's why they're blue. Um, that was a direct quote from the founder of Equinex. Um, but, uh, but they're meant to provide some reassurance um, that your interconnection is in good hands. Uh, whose hands it's in um, is obviously up for debate. Um, uh, this is the core switch um, of uh, DKICS in Frankfurt. Um, I, um, I went to, to visit it um, with Arnold Nipper, whose um, picture was on screen yesterday. Uh, and um, I said, what's this? What's that? How does this work? Um, and, then, um, and then I wrote this, uh, where he had explained to me that um, for backup, the, uh, a certain percentage, 5% of the traffic going through DKICS is, is, uh, is shunted off 
um, to their backup location. So if something happens with this switch, there's another data center across town in Frankfurt that will immediately take over. That 5% of that traffic uh, is kept, um, kept live just so everyone knows that things are working fine. Um, it was in the summer of 2013 um, with the Snowden revelations that it, that it turned out that coincidentally 5% um, of DKIX's traffic um, was not only going for backup but was also going um, to uh, the NSA or, or the BND or whichever, whichever it might have been. We heard about that yesterday. Um, that's a, a leap of speculation on my part, but I think a fairly fair one, <laughs> right? Uh, the, our, the article below was uh, from the Financial Times, but obviously there was a lot, a lot written in more, more in German than in English. Um, but always this, um, always this, again and again and again, um, this fiber optic patch panel um, that, that is the inter and internet, that is the place where the, network, where the router of one network connects to the router of another network. Um, and I think that, that the, the diplomacy, um, the, the, the human diplomacy, uh, the decision to connect those networks um, is made um, by two network engineers. Um, it it's doesn't happen automatically. Um, two people say, what kind of traffic do you have? What kind of traffic do I have? Should we connect our networks? Uh, maybe it's not equal. Why don't I pay you? I'll become your customer. Uh, maybe I'm Netflix, and if I connect you, then your bandwidth bill from, uh, from a, a, a middle mile provider or a backbone provider will go way down. But what was amazing to me was to recognize that, that between, you know, at, at, at every single moment of interconnection of the internet, there were always two network engineers um, who, had, who had made that decision together. And then there was always somebody, a technician, um, who uh, got a, a, you know, a, a work order uh, from a printer in a little office um, in one of these buildings and with numbers on it that said, uh, you have to connect uh, this port to this port with this kind of cable. Um, and uh, then he or she, but, but almost always he, um, goes out onto the cold data center floor um, with a ladder and, uh, and a loop of cable and um, plugs in to router, plugs into the, runs it up in the ceiling, you know, strains their back to reach up to do it, and then drops it down to the other place. And um, there's no other way to do it. Um, this, isn't, this isn't hyperbole, there's just no other, there's no other way to do it. Uh, if two networks are going to connect, um, at some point, I mean, they can connect virtually and logically, which we kind of do constantly, but at, at some point in that process, um, somebody actually climbed up in a ladder and, and lay that, lay that, you know, put, put that jumper between, between the cables. Um, it's worth saying as well that the data centers are, are pretty unpleasant places to work in. Um, they're cold and they're really loud. Um, often the people who you see kind of crouched uh, in the corner um, wearing a hoodie because it's cold um, are uh, unhappy because they're fixing something that's broken. Um, and so you kind of, uh, you walk down the aisles of these places um, and you, you kind of, you know, if you can't hear their size because it's too loud, um, but it's just a, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of misery involved. Um, and, um, and that's, uh, that's, that's how it works. That's how it fits together. Um, the other sign you know uh, that you're in a important data center, a place where networks connect to each other, um, are the um, cardboard boxes with routers in them that are littered everywhere. Um, you walk into these places and there's a very specific smell uh, to the internet that's a little bit like burnt toast, um, but I, it's, it's not just a, like electricity smell, it's like a data center smell. Um, nobody's quite been able to tell me what the mixture is. Um, I'm, do any of you work in data centers regularly? No, uh, okay, yeah, but, it's, but you walk in immediately, you know it, and then you see these, these cardboard boxes somewhere along the way uh, and you know, that, you know that, they're, that they're there. And then you come to this room, um, which is my favorite, um, where the rest of the place is, is, uh, is cold and loud. Um, this room is um, hot and, and quiet and smells like dirt. Um, it's, it's where the fiber comes out of the ground. Uh, it's the fiber vault. Um, this is not my picture. This is a very, this is a kind of a, a, like a, a contraband picture um, of the fiber vault in Ashburn. Um, I've never, um, I, I was in it, but I couldn't take photos, but somebody sent me this picture later. Um, but for me, this was the kind of, this was the room that kind of fit it all together because uh, it was the place where this, this, this digital network um, connected to the, to, the, to, the, to the geologic crust, right? This was, this, this was where the two pieces came together. Um, and you, you knew that as soon as you walked in because of, um, because of its smell, very simply. Manhole. Um, okay, so the, if they're the places where networks connect to each other, they're the, the cables. Um, as I just say that, I, I, I just became terrified that for the, I would 
I'm supposed to be talking about the cables the whole time. No, it's okay, right? <laughs> um, the, um, uh, this was another of Randall's photographs from the Wired essay, and uh, this was another bizarre conversation of, um, are, is there a manhole where the cables land? Yes, which is the most beautiful manhole? Um, this is the most beautiful manhole in the eastern seaboard. Uh, it's Halifax. Um, it's the Hibernia Atlantic cable. Um, it was a place that we were allowed to photograph, uh, unlike uh, the, the TAT cables, unlike the, the cables, um, I guess to, to put it straightforwardly, are tapped by the NSA, um, because it's owned by a very small company. It's a kind of boutique cable company. Uh, and so the permission to get in there was very straightforward and to call them up and say, you know, would you like to be included in this article in Wired that is going to tell everyone about your cable? Um, and they said, that sounds great. Thank you. When do you want to come? And I went and spent two days in Halifax um, with the run of the place. Uh, and um, the, uh, you know, and, um, because of that experience and because of my visits to, a f to um, uh, I guess it's four other cable landing stations, uh, when uh, the Snowden documents came out, um, I was uh, disbelieving. Um, not actually that I thought they, were, they weren't right, but I just couldn't believe that I had missed it. Um, I couldn't believe that there were these taps there, and, and, or I mean, I could tell you at Hibernian Atlantic, I mean, every box, I said, what's that, what's that, what's that? And um, he wasn't lying to me. Uh, Nova Scotians are not known for their, for their deception. Um, and, uh, and he, um, you know, there, there was just no doubt in my mind that I hadn't, that I hadn't missed, that I, you know, that I, that I, that I missed something in these places. Um, I mean, we were doing things like this, um, you know, you know let's, let's, this is the, this is the first, first part of the cable across the Atlantic. And as a result, it, it was only as more and more documents were revealed and I began to piece together, not that there was a kind of full parallel internet, but in fact it was like in Frankfurt with small percentages siphoned off um, that uh, managed to stand in for a large majority of the traffic. Um, and I began to sort of recognize that, that the, it wasn't, the technical accomplishment wasn't to create a mirror internet, um, but was in the sifting through uh, of, of what exists there already. Um, for as many places that, uh, companies that said, okay, sure, come see our data center, um, there were also a couple that said no. Uh, I spent um, a couple weeks trying to find the right um, press person at AT&T um, who to even begin a conversation about visiting an AT&T cable landing station. Um, and gave up. There just there wasn't. They couldn't figure out what who that person would be, or pretended not to be able to figure out who that person would be. Uh, the Apollo cable, um, which we know in fact is tapped. Um, I had met the the CEO of um, of their, the holding company that owns it, uh, and um, he was very helpful and quite friendly and had lots to share. Um, he's a former military guy uh, in London. Um, and then when I said, okay, you know, we've been talking for a while. Can I come see your cable? Um, this, uh, this was his response to me in an email. Um, at his office, uh, he said, no, no, you know, we, that's not happening. Um, and it was the definitiveness of, of his answer surprised me because it wasn't what I was hearing from other places. Uh, I suspected it, I mean, that there was a kind of military piece to it somehow, uh, and he kind of said as much. Um, but in retrospect, it was quite clear that the reason I couldn't go poke around the Apollo landing station in, 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 in Bude uh, was because, um, in fact, there, if you pointed at this box and said, what's that? Um, the answer would have been, what's the code word? Well, yeah. What's the, what's the program yesterday? Okay. Um, G, G I, yeah, okay. Um, and that's, and again, I mean, I've been haunted by this uh, for the last three years of what did I miss? Um, what, was, what, what, was, what was actually happening when I was in these places? Why didn't I see anything? Um, the network engineers um, didn't talk about it. They dismissed it. Um, there had been, uh, there's James Bradford's book about the NSA and his description of May East, which was one of the kind of an original exchange points, um, uh, didn't match my understanding of it. He seemed to have gotten it wrong. Um, that didn't sort of inspire confidence that what he was saying uh, held a lot of water. Um, and uh, I had been determined to avoid all conspiracy and innuendo, that I was only going to write about what I saw and what somebody told me. Um, and I wasn't going to sort of fall into that. I was going to be very, you know, very precise about having everything check out and, um, and seeing it with my own eyes um, or hearing it from multiple sources. Um, and it wasn't there. Um, it wasn't there at all. And I think um, that was, there were, the gap there had two pieces. Um, one, the just basic legal requirement that some of these um, 
network owners uh, cooperate um, with government requests and be quiet about it and be silent about it. So there were some people who knew and knew that they couldn't say anything legally. Uh, and there were some people who, uh, who didn't know. Um, their, either their network had never been approached for tapping. Um, and um, as, uh, as, um, as we saw yesterday and um, as uh, um, the, the whole gang that's been, that's been doing such amazing work um, with, uh, the, with, the, 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 um, with the Snowden Archive showed, you know, there, there are some companies that participate intensely and others that don't. Uh, and that sort of game of cat and mouse is really clear. And in retrospect, it's the exact mirror image of the places that I was able to access and the places, the places that I wasn't. Uh, I did go to Cornwall. Um, this is your Cornwall bingo card. Um, so you can put Cornwall. I don't have a surfing or french fry picture. <laughs> um, but I did eat french fries. Um, after trying to understand where these cable landing stations were, uh, the guy who I was supposed to see at the White Sands landing station uh, two days before I was supposed to see him um, emailed this picture, this map that he had made. Uh, can you not take a picture of that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Um, the, uh, the, um, and I sort of said, had I, you know, had I been trying, you know, had I actually been trying to understand where all these stations were, this was, this was it. This was the Holy Grail. This was the map I had been trying to put together. Um, it, when you go there, it's actually not that mysterious because they all kind of line up. There's no mistaking um, that these are cable landing stations. Um, but to go from that sense of conspiracy and innuendo and, you know, and looking at the cryptome site of where these cables land um, to the map uh, that a guy named Joel Palling, who no longer works for what was then Global Crossing, to what he made about his neighbors, essentially, um, was yet another reminder that these places are, are made and managed by, by real people. Um, that this is their job. Um, they, they, they work there and they live there. Uh, and, um, and that was, a, I mean, that was a refrain again and again, um, that, they're, that for as much as there's a, 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 um, a, a sort of instinct to, uh, to look at the, particularly um, post Snowden, to look at this as, a, uh, as being guided by nefarious forces, um, there is also, a, a, there are also people on the ground who are, who are, who are running it um, and who know it and who take care of it and, um, and for the most part take care of it quite well. Uh, this is one of them. Um, uh, he is, um, like many of them, uh, an English engineer. Um, he is, like many of them, um, 45. Um, they all seem to be 45 uh, or 42 at the time that I met them. Um, because um, they all started at the same time. They all started in the boom, sort of 96, 97, coming out of, coming out of, out of university and getting a job in the, in the, in the cable business. Um, Simon uh, worked for, for Tata Communications, um, which had the distinction uh, of, uh, I think this was mentioned yesterday, of, of not only having an undersea cable system around the world, um, in, a, in a full belt um, so they could send your bits one way or the other, but also in building new cables um, going north and south. Um, and as an, as an Indian-owned company, um, very deliberately sort of taking advantage of, of those north-south ties rather than the, 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 the biggest cables in the past being east-west. Um, and Tata was very eager to um, make their brand well-known in the U.S., um, which meant uh, when I asked if I could see a cable landing um, on a beach, a new cable, um, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were ready to try to sort of figure that out. Um, the logistics of it were tricky, though, because the cable landings, the actual day depended on the wind, it depended on when the manufacturers of the cables, companies like, um, like Alcatel-Lucent, um, actually kind of had their act together. Uh, so, um, so the result was I had about a three days notice um, uh, where Simon called and said, um, on a Thursday, and said, "If you could get to, uh, if you could get to Lisbon um, on Monday uh, at nine o'clock, um, this guy was gonna was gonna walk out of the water." Um, uh, and he did. Um, it was a, a Spanish underwater construction team um, that he had a nylon messenger line, a lightweight line, and uh, and he um, was, came in a skiff and in his wetsuit and came out, and then they connected it. To, um, to the Alcatel Lucent ship, um, cable link ship that was out there, uh, and then floated it on these, on these buoys. And then when it was in position, you can see the English engineers uh, looking on. Um, when it was in position, the guy um, with the wetsuit went back in the water um, with a machete and cut the buoys, and the buoys pop up, and the cable drops down to the, to the, to the, to the seafloor. And he does this the whole kilometer out to the ship. Um, and then they, when he gets there, they give him a glass of juice and a cookie. 
and he jumps back in the water and he swims back to shore and he lights a cigarette. Uh, and then they start getting ready to, um, to, uh, to connect it um, to the shore end, um, to the piece that had come down from the landing station a couple miles up the hill. Uh, and um, I'm a little wary of adding to the internet infrastructure bingo by telling you about the cafe that, from which I watched this cable. <laughs> um, but uh, but this, the manhole was kind of by the kitchen door of this cafe overlooking the beach. Um, and the, the guy who was in charge of the landing station for Tata, who was kind of hosting this you know, operation that was costing Tata tens of millions of dollars, um, was very nervous, um, was not very happy that I was there, uh, sort of in, you know, you know, <laughs> wanting to sit across from him and have him narrate what was happening, um, alternating between, between beer and espresso at this, uh, at, this, at this cafe. And then when they were working on this, um, on this, on cutting the cable with a hacksaw uh, to get through the steel barrier, to get through the copper tube that supplies the electricity for the regeneration, um, regeneration uh, units that, that are every 50 miles on the seafloor, um, and then finally getting down to the, the, the fiber optic strands at the, at, the, at the heart of the cable that are, that are the things that actually transmit the light, that transmits the data. While they're going at this with a hacksaw, there's a guy with a bucket delivering fish. So it's, I mean, it's, and it's like six feet away. So they're, they're there with this hacksaw and there's this guy with this bucket of bloody fish. Um, and you know, don't, don't tell me the internet's a cloud, right? I mean, you know, that's the, the, just the, the physicality of it was, was astounding. Not just that it was something that you had to go out with a hacksaw, um, but that it was something in, in, in my physical world, that it was something that, that, um, that, that was part of this, um, that, was, that was part of sensory, our, our sensory experience that was actually there um, that didn't require, uh, you know, um, plugging, plugging into some wire um, or wasn't even, even wireless. And of course, the, um, the human, again, with the, with the, the, the labor of it, the, the tradition is, is long and, and consistent. Uh, you can see the English engineers in the background. Um, this is from, uh, from Hong Kong in the 20s. Um, you can see the local laborers, um, and it wasn't fiber, but it was copper, but the, but the, but the basic structure of it was, was there. Uh, and, the, um, and the places are the same, these classic port cities of, uh, you know, of New York, of London, uh, Mombasa, Mumbai, Singapore. Um, these are the places that the cables have always connected. Uh, and um, telegeography um, over the last um, five or 10 years has kind of embraced all of our sort of steampunk fantasies of that. Um, Marcus Krasetsha, who's the cartographer there, who, who makes these maps, um, there's been this kind of uh, charming evolution from them always having them look like something from the back of a science fiction novel and sort of blacks and reds and, you know, and, and, uh, and in sans serif typefaces um, has realized that it would also be fun to kind of imagine them uh, with the full arc of their history rather than um, as something, uh, uh, something um, uh, um, only, made of, only made of light or only made of, made of the internet. Manhole. <laughs> um, uh, no, I can't do that. I can't. I can't leave that manhole joke there. Can't leave a manhole without a good story. Um, the uh, um, they put the cover back on, they push the sand over it, and then this village goes back to where it is. Um, and um, and that for me was the sort of perfect perfect metaphor for the for the lack of recognition of how these of 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 of, of, of how we think about these that we that we don't think about these places, and the refrain um, I think the last couple of days. Um, and I, I mean, and I love um, how I love how, how how poetically Trevor puts it, both in words and in his images. But that you need you need to make these things visible somehow. Um, they're there, but even if you went to this village, um, you wouldn't see it. It would be under the sand. Um, but it's still there, and to to begin to try to find images for it um, seems to me like a, a perfectly legitimate reason to um, to go to these places and go go searching go searching for manholes. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. The last piece of the puzzle, um, through the kind of three categories of internet places, there's the um, there's the places where networks connect to each other. There's the lines in between, uh, and there's the places where data uh, is stored and processed. The kind of the, the data centers. The places where networks connect to each other are kind of data centers too, but they're special data centers. They're you know, the the other kind of warehousey data centers are, are another story. Um, this is my photograph from the, the woods behind Facebook's data center uh, in Prineville, Oregon. Um, this is the power lines that they had installed to feed that data center. Uh, when I was there, they were, there was one building. Um, actually, I should have checked. Are they now up to three 
or four, uh, something, a lot. The, the, I mean, the, the, you can't keep up with the numbers because the scale keeps growing and growing and growing. And yet, if I had an image going into this that these were belching factories, um, the, the efficiency of keeping these places, of, of locating these places where power is cheapest um, and hopefully not produced by coal, uh, and in where it's cold enough to use outside cooling to keep some of the servers um, keep some of the servers running, um, although I, uh, uh, that's not necessarily always the case anymore. Um, the, I'm actually quite astounded by the um, by the per uh, by the, the the per user energy consumption that Facebook reports, um, and um, so is Greenpeace. It's actually been this kind of amazing story of the. Of, of Greenpeace again and again celebrating the successes of the at least the big internet giants um, in reducing um, the carbon footprint and increasing the efficiency of these data centers. Um, and, um, and there's a real impulse to sort of tell the opposite story um, and say, oh, well, we're not counting all the different hops and things like that. Um, and uh, I, I, I did report it out once and the answer kept coming back again and again that um, it was, I wish I, I, should, I wish I remember the exact number, but it was something like the, the carbon emissions of driving a mile to the library is equal to your year's worth of, of, of iPhone charging. It was just the, the scale of it was completely, uh, completely you know, astonishing compared to, to moving ourselves to the physical world. And not surprisingly, because of that, uh, these companies have started celebrating these places. And for me, uh, as a writer about architecture, um, the difference from the blank door in Ashburn to Facebook's um, deliberate effort to monumentalize this building somehow, to, 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 to express on the outside what it does on the inside, uh, and to celebrate it um, as architecture, the sort of most basic definition of architecture, um, was, um, was, was a really amazing change. And, and I think Facebook sort of gets credit for being the first to, to open up their doors. Um, and while uh, there's a joke to me, I guess, about, about Facebook and, and, and privacy, um, it was the first inkling that the winds were, were changing, um, that no longer were data centers going to subscribe to the Fight Club rule, which is the first rule of data centers is don't talk about data centers, um, but that these were going to start to become more and more public. Um, celebrated in Facebook Blue, a picture that began to replace that amorphous blob as an iconic picture of the internet, uh, one of a few. Um, it was, in contrast, and, and slower than Facebook to kind of come to terms with this, uh, was, was Google. Um, this was, I think, the most single most chilling um, and terrifying thing that I saw uh, in my travels to the internet, um, which was Google Maps um, uh, satellite image of Google's data center in the Dallas in Oregon. This is no longer the image. It's been replaced with an actual image. But it's not that this satellite image comes from the time before Google built their data center in the Dallas and Oregon, which is their, their first ground up data center, um, but is scrubbed out. Um, the image is, 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 the data center is scrubbed out of the image quite, 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 um, quite poorly at that. Um, and if the first rule of geography is that those who make, make the maps have the power, um, Google made this map uh, and they removed themselves from it. Um, and when I visited uh, the Dalles um, in, uh, in 2011, um, the only sign in the door said Voldemort Industries. Uh, um, a, a kind of a astoundingly sort of juvenile joke for the place that was the repository of our most precious things, right? Um, and, uh, and while I had, by the time I got there, had gone to, 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 to you know, I, th I think the number was at, at least 50 of these places, um, Google's was, Google was the outlier in terms of understanding uh, what I was trying to understand. And I can say just from a reporting standpoint, I thought I had, there were two things that were going to happen when I tried to visit a Google data center. Either they were going to say, no, thank you. Um, they were going to let me in and it was going to be this great scoop. And then a month before my book came out, you know, the New York Times was going to write the same story. Um, and that wouldn't be good um, as a journalist. But instead, they gave me this incredible gift, um, which was they proved um, their complete lack of emotional corporate intelligence um, in giving me a tour of the data center, quote unquote, that was really a tour of the parking lot. Um, and when I asked um, what, the, what happened inside, which is kind of what you would ask if you were in Oregon, in Google's parking lot, you know, what goes on inside this building? It's sort of a good open-ended question. And the answer was, um, I'm sure that's information that we have, but it's not something we can share at this time. Um, which is to say it was the answer that the guy was told to give. Um, and then we 
walked across the parking lot to see the, the Googler's organic garden, but it was winter, so it was sort of like, here's our patch of dirt. <laughs> um, then we had this delicious lunch, and they went around the table, and the press person asked each one to tell me how many people applied for their job. Um, and it was, it was just, it was such an incredible disconnect um, between, uh, between um, the, the, the recognition everywhere else that there was a good reason for knowing what these places were made of and how they worked. Um, and, uh, and these were, the, you know, and, and, and that wasn't, you know, it wasn't just we'll take care of it for you. Um, it wasn't just, you know, no need to worry, we've got it. Um, but that, that there was a sort of basic sense to understand it. Um, architecturally, it looked like a prison, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't know who chose the shade of yellow. It said, let's paint the data center yellow, um, the sort of penitentiary yellow. Um, but, um, but alas, uh, that is no longer the case. We now have a beautiful picture of Google's data center. Um, and um, this was a set of images uh, that Wired published um, in fall of 2002, 2012, um, taken by by Google's, by a photographer commissioned by Google, um, as was then revealed and we talked about yesterday, some of them uh, photoshopped, uh, so not actually, once again, journalistic images, but images that were provided. Um, but, uh, but it's also um, was the beginning of a recognition um, that they could no longer not talk about these places. Um, this is Google's data center website. Um, uh, the timeline um, for 2012 is the year of transparency. Um, <laughs> And now, um, as of, when is this, a month ago or so, six weeks ago, um, the Google Data Center Mural Project. Um, I've, I, my dream is like a brewery tour, like where you can go and get a tour of the data center and then buy a t-shirt. Um, we're not quite there yet, but, um, but we're, getting, we're getting closer. Uh, this is um, Jenny O'Dell's mural in Oklahoma, we said, right? Yeah. I had to pick, I, I just was, I, I was trying to choose the best Google mural, data center mural, and I couldn't figure out what the criteria for choosing my favorite of Google's data center murals was. Like, do you want the one that's actually the cloud, or should it be more abstract, or the best? Like, like, again, to even begin to sort of look at these, you know, treat these images in any aesthetic way, um, it just again and again sort of highlights our confusion about what we, what we do with the fact that these places actually exist. Um, this is my kind of hopeful, my sort of hopeful image of, of possibility for infrastructure. Uh, it's the Bonneville Dam, uh, just down the road from, from the Dalles. Uh, it's a massive public works project um, uh, from, you know, built the WPA, which was the, the, the U.S. government response to the, dep to the, to the Depression. Uh, and it's run by the Army Corps of Engineers, and um, uh, there's an armed guard, and you, uh, walk in and um, she searched my trunk and then she said, come on in. Uh, and then when you go inside to this piece of critical infrastructure, um, there's a fish ladder where you watch the salmon swim upstream and you can like look in at the big, uh, big turbines. Uh, and there's a gift shop and it's just this recognition that it, these places don't have to be secret. Uh, and as complicated as the environmental and political and economic history is of, of this place in particular, um, there's, there's still a language and a way for them to be open uh, and accessible. Um, and um, it's been, a, it's been um, reassuring, uh, particularly in light of the more, um, the less reassuring currents of who runs the internet and who reads the internet uh, and, and, um, and, uh, and, how, and, and, and who, how, how it's surveilled. It was reassuring, it has been reassuring to see that the arc of of, of, in, of internet infrastructure has been moving towards more transparency uh, and towards more discussion, um, which I guess is what we've been doing the last, last couple of days. So, thank you. So, thank you, Andrew. A very, very, very interesting talk. And uh, let me start opening the discussion with the questions. I mean, we have seen a lot of images of landing points or cable <coughs> end stations and stuff like that. And I wondered, I mean, throughout the history of our civilization, powers, the actual power structures always manifested in, in an impressive architecture. They wanted to express their power in, in the architecture as well. 
uh, when we when we look at these images, well, you you, you showed two two examples that are different, but most of these images, I mean, we've seen landing points that had the charm of a public urinal or uh, the most important or door in the internet <laughs> is a shitty building. So why why is it that these powers, that these internet powers, do not express them? the power visually? Are they afraid that we know what's going on? Or what's, what's the reason behind that? What do you think? I think, I mean, the, one of the currents of data center tradition was financial services. You know, so the, the banks were the first users of these, and the military were the first or second users of these places. And so, um, and so I, think, I think that there, there was a tradition of keeping them quiet. And in fact, the bank data centers are still the ones that are kind of hardest to, to find. Um, that's a simple answer. I think there's a, uh, also a lot of, um, I, th I think a lot of it is a, a, a culture among network engineers and network builders. Um, I don't, I don't want to, towards um, inhabiting not just the network itself, but the, their own fantasy of the network. Uh, and I think that there's, you know, again and again, you see these places are, are commercial. They're all privately owned. Uh, their customers um, are, uh, are, are, are geeks. That's, that is, that's, that's, that's described. And, and I, I was always amazed that when you say, okay, how do we sell this place? What do we make of it? Um, it really was the sense that these places were designed to appeal to the people who are in them. And so um, there was, some of it is, uh, is, this, is the sense that they have to be secret to please the auditors. And some of it is the sense that if they're secret, it makes the going to them um, special. So it's, uh, it's, it's basically they, they have a physical reality that looks like, well, it, it's in a way of hiding, but they present themselves in the cyberspace mm -hmm. uh, exactly as power structures before did in the physical world by having nice websites that express their, their power. And they... And they um, they, I, I do think that the keeping them anonymous and hidden like this um, f has furthered the tradition of the internet being run by the by the by the key holders. Um, I do think that the that there, that the, the culture of a, of exclusive knowledge um, can be read in the uh, in the secrecy of these buildings. I mean, you mentioned in the beginning that um, th that the internet consists of many, many parts owned by many, many people or entities. Um, but what we see over time is that there's a kind of concentration so that power gets concentrated more and more. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that will not ha have a physical uh, uh, representation, but what does that mean for the internet if more and more of the more important infrastructure belongs to less people? I mean, this is like... Uh, this, this is like what we see in wealth as well. It's, it's the, yeah. uh, a few have more and uh, many have less. And it's, as you asked that question, I, I, I realized that it, that was not a point that I made very clearly tonight. And it's, it's, it's a crucial point that, um, that the health of the internet, to my mind, depends on the sort of checks and balances of, of many networks interconnecting. And so to be a network on the internet means that you take care of your own network, but you have to connect to other networks. Uh, and and that sort of keeps you honest. Um, and if any one network gets too big, um, then you lose those checks and balances. And that's that's essentially exactly what we're seeing um, at the moment um, with the rise of these super networks um, of the Googles and Facebooks and and, and Microsofts of the world. Um, I was very confused um, by the moment. I guess it was um, uh, would have been last fall uh, or maybe a full year ago when there was this discussion about Brazil breaking off from the internet. Um, and the, the impulse was don't break the internet. Um, and um, and I, I, wasn't, I didn't completely agree with that. Um, I kind of thought that the internet as a network of networks is more resilient than that. And a lot of the, the, the drum beating to not break the internet was, um, was, uh, was Google not wanting to break the internet, um, which is to say Google not wanting to, to continue to um, their, their sort of process of hegemony being slow in any, in any way. Um, and um, I, again, I'm, I, I'm prefer to, to, to stick to these 
to what I see in the buildings rather than the, in, the, in the policy realm. Um, but um, but I, I, do, um, I do recognize that that's a, a, a bit of a break from the orthodoxy of, 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 of what internet freedom means. So. I mean, this, what you just mentioned with Brazil, I mean, we have the same thing here in Germany mm -hmm. uh, to, to have a separate internet uh, where internet traffic within Germany is only rooted within Germany. Um, of course, that's when politicians who have no clue of how the internet works or what it really is uh, starts to have fantasies on how to control or how to, to, uh, uh, co how to contain it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is, uh, uh, of course, something we as the, as the internet natives uh, have to take care of. We should not have the politicians uh, mm -hmm. too much to say about that. Um, but let, let's come back to the, to, the, to the story you were talking about. What can we as the normal internet users, and we normally only see the results of the internet on our screen, we never see the physical reality. So mm -hmm. what, what can we actually learn uh, from going to these places? <laughs> I mean, the. I mean, there, there are. Well, I mean, there, there, there are two ways to answer that. I mean, for me, the, 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 the Snowden revelations were, uh, were a, a satisfying acknowledgement that this infrastructure has political consequences. That's one thing. Um, the flip side, though, and. Again, your questions are astute because it's it's something I it's a point I, I like to make and I I didn't make it tonight. But um, my visit to Facebook was profoundly disappointing, um, not because I didn't like get a good tour, um, but because I just I couldn't connect Facebook on a good day with these stupid blue lights. I just the 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 thing that Facebook provided on a good day um, was um, had nothing to do with its machinery. Is that, is that really sad? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't, I, I don't, it's not a, it's just, I don't, I don't think we need, we can, we can find certain meaning in these buildings and this infrastructure, um, but, but only, only circumscribed meaning. So it's the experience of the internet that's more important than its physical reality in this sense? I, I mean, I, 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 I can't begin to synthesize the, ex the experience of the internet. Um, I can acknowledge the joyfulness of going to these places. I think you said you get that from all of us who, who tell these stories about traveling to these places, that there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a thrill, as there's always been a thrill in going out into the world and seeing places and trying to understand them. Um, uh, you know, when you walk around, um, when you're a tourist anywhere, um, you know, you, the, there's, then you begin to recognize the, the absurdity of the tourist path um, you know the the actors in in, in military costume at Checkpoint Charlie. Um, it doesn't seem these manholes don't seem like such a strange place to go look for understanding of what's happening. Right. So I think it's time to open up the discussion and for questions from the public. So feel free to ask. Can you hear me? Um, I was wondering, Andrew, um, you got to know, like one of your primary tools is to really get to know people and, and to, you know, spend time with the people in the machine room of the internet. Um, I've always found it difficult to connect with network engineers, sort of on a human scale. Uh, no offense if there are any here. It's just been difficult for me. And especially there are a few that seem to me very concerned about the bigger picture of what they're doing because they're just poking around in their individual boxes. And so someone like Mark Klein for me was a, a different breed than most of the ones I've dealt with. Have you seen a change since what you did until now in their sort of attitude? And, and am I wrong in, in sort of romanticizing about the, the politically and historically engaged network engineer as opposed to these sort of just following orders, sir, um, kind of people? I mean, I, I think that the network engineers that um, that I was most um, engaged by and liked the most and, and got the most out of in terms of understanding how the internet worked um, were the, the group of, of internet workers, you know, my term, not, not theirs, but, um, but the, the people who weren't in charge of managing networks but were in charge of connecting their networks to other networks. Um, and, you know, that was, that was most, you know, most dramatic at a, um, like at a, the one set of numbers I heard was from Microsoft. Um, Microsoft has 100,000 plus employees, uh, somewhere an order of magnitude of a couple hundred people working on their global network. 
And of that couple hundred, somewhere on the order of magnitude of two or maybe five responsible for connecting their global network to other global networks. Um, so you're talking about a, a global pool of perhaps 500 people um, who are primarily responsible for these interconnections. Um, and they're diplomats. I mean, they are, they are, I mean, they are, they have to interact with other humans, right? I mean, that's, and they have to do it well. And I think for me that was, uh, that was fortuitous because as a result, um, they, uh, they uh, were, they were able to, um, to connect what they were doing to a, to a broader, a broader world in some way or another. Um, there were, I mean, there were, there were some, um, there were some sort of, uh, some sort of disgusting moments um, with the, you know, with with the network engineers that uh, a, they're a kind of um, a, a libertarian streak um, that was that was extreme. I think even by by Silicon Valley standards. Um, uh, I mean, in the, you know, there are guns and strip clubs and things like that um, that were um, that I think uh, at times um, sort of made me nervous for. You know whose hands this were in that it it didn't have a a, a um I don't know I I don't I don't it's a, a hard I I I don't I'm, I don't want to draw those lines the lines too starkly of 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 a uh, of the of this of a of either a, a of a of a political ecology or morality of it but but um but there are certainly moments where I said this is you know this is this is this this is not not reassuring the other moments of amazing competence. Um, and uh, an amazing pride in, in what they had built and how much it matters. Um, but I do, I mean, but my, my main, my, my most exciting moments were, the, were those human interactions, absolutely. So. Hello, uh, my name is Tanit, I come from Barcelona. Um, my, the thing that I wanted to say mostly is thank you for writing the book because you gave sense of my last three years of work. <laughs> When I, when I read it, I am a photographer. I'm not a hacker, not even a journalist or anything like that. But I, I suddenly saw a photographic story. Uh, it's, very, it's something that I want to see. It's something, I mean, it, I had the urge to start working on that. I got a fund from, uh, from a bank in Spain that helps uh, artists. Mm -hmm and I'm working on it. Uh, the idea is to follow the physical path that an email that I wrote to Leonard Kleinrock, uh, I, I follow it photographically. I met him last year, I went to LA, uh, I took pictures of the room and all that. And um, for me it's really, really thrilling. You know, in, in Spain I've, I've, of course, my, my big job here is to get the access to the places and get the access not only to get the door open but to have the possibility to take pictures. I go with my large format camera that it's 20 kilos, it's like a big, big stuff. And I have to say that um, for now, I've been, uh, they've been really, really helpful, yeah. you know? And it's surprising to me because uh, my question is, what do I have to look for? Because there is some is something else hidden that I don't see, that they don't show me. Sometimes I get like um, questions like, well, maybe you don't have to take pictures here because it's the part of our clients. But still nothing like really, really that I see that it's hidden. And I'm, I'm really curious, you know, because I want to, to I know, I want to know more. I mean, the, the, again and again, this contradiction between my own, you know, between wanting to, as a journalist, to erase conspiracy and between conspiracy and, and facts bringing us back towards conspiracy um, is just, is just is a, it seems inseparable from, from thinking about these things. I mean, it's one reason I thought Anne's talk yesterday was so interesting of, of, of her own struggle in trying to unravel what's going on, what the German government in cooperation with the partners is, is actually doing and who really understands it and who's making these decisions. And, and there aren't yet answers. And even the Snowden archive itself is a, is a sort of reading of tea leaves of trying to sort of make, you know, what, what's projection and what's a pitch and, and what is actually happening. Um, but, I, but, that, I mean, but that process keeps going. I mean, and, and certainly when you see the, 
the, the greater transparency and the greater understanding of how things work over the last 10 years or five years, um, it, that's, that, that changes the terms, I think. But I am, I, I mean, I love, it's great fun here that like what, whatever weird gene uh, those of us have that makes us want to you know, engage with these places, like what, what, what aren't we getting from our, you know, from, our, from our web pages in some way. So. Any more questions? Any more questions? No. Hi, I'm from Barcelona as well. Um, yeah, well. Uh, in the last two and a half years, well, I'm very happy that you mentioned the CO2 emissions related to the internet, because I've been researching the issue in the last two and a half years, and I've been trying to make visual experiments in order to, uh, to show this problem, and basically to embed it like in the social imagination, because I think it's something that is really far away from the, the speech now. And I was wondering, because uh, through my research, I found very, very hard, and all the, the um, studies that I read, they claim, that uh, it's really, really hard to really, um, how you call it, to uh, calculate the real emissions that the internet uh, emits. So I wonder, like all these giants, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., how they, uh, they calculate this and which is the margin they have to actually fake it. So that's the question. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The total numbers seem impossible to calculate because there are so many small pieces and the, the kind of scary underbelly of it, of, of either small local data centers or data centers in offices or things like that, you know, are, um, are uh, I mean, that's the part that I think is, is the problem. Um, the, I don't, I mean, again, uh, there, there are things to, to I, I, don't, I don't think this is so naive that among the things to lie about on the part of these corporate giants, um, their, the emissions is the one. Is that hardly naive? Is that I mean, <laughs> I mean, it just it, it seems that these these numbers um, they're motivated by their the efficient they're motivated to be more efficient for their own economic reasons, um, and um, they're motivated by the PR benefit, um, and um, and it's an engineering problem, um, and I think they love engineering problems, um, and also the I think the basic structure of it is is on their side of of. Uh, of this separate, um, you know, quite creepy idea when you step back from it uh, that we are putting all of our eggs in just a few baskets. So, any other questions? Yes. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you did any research on on attacks on the infrastructure because I think with making the places more visible that that's in the air. You yeah. Know? So do you know of any actual attempts to attack or um, was it part of your research? Did you find it? it came up every day. Um, how do we, you know, the, I got the question constantly, you know, how do you destroy the internet? Um, uh, it's people, I mean, there, there have been a couple of good articles where people went through methodically um, how you would destroy the internet. Uh, I, um, you know, it is the. Im I mean, the straightforward answer is that the impulse um, that it would it would be hard, um, and you can't really keep it secret anyway. Um, so that talking about it uh, doesn't, you know, only helps people become more aware of of what it's made of. Um, so I don't think there's a kind of risk in talking about it. Uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, the, the weirdest story from the last year was when this this. Essentially, uh, someone at the Pentagon leaked that they believed um, you know, the Russian Navy was trying to cut undersea cables using submarines, um, and um, and it it just it, it the only reason you would do that is as a uh, as a, a sort of overt aggressive act of war. Like it would seem to have no tactical benefit because like you would have you know politicians in Moscow and, you know getting not getting not being able to get into their Gmail right. It would just it would kind of the, the repercussions are impossible to imagine, um, but uh, I mean that was a that didn't really hold water to me. Um, but I, you know, can't begin to speculate on on Russian military motivations. Um, so I just I don't I, you know that this notion that it can be that we should worry about it being physically destroyed um, it seems far down the list uh, of worries compared to um, a the 
the the sort of threat of to the to the sort of freedom and 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 longevity of the internet by the internet giants, uh, and then on the other side um, by the by the government actors. So, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, yes.